Good morning. Please rise in body or spirit and join me in singing What Wondrous Love, which is hymn number 18 in the gray hymnal. And the words are always on the screen. It could be a smile or a poem or a new daylight that finds you through an open window, or perhaps remembering that tomorrow was never promised. It could be the scent of baking bread, the first chill of autumn that has you reaching for your favorite wool sweater. Or maybe it's the noticing of how easily red maple becomes and lets go. It could be taking today off, to be still, to unknown, to notice, to practice loosening your troubled grip, because grace can never be gripped or grabbed. It could be choosing softness in a world grown hard, because you're tired of hurting and being hurt, and mercy is the best kind of medicine. It could be an invitation to gather around the listening table where every color is beautiful, where there is no blame, no shame, no them, no other. As we light our chalice this morning, we realize it could be any of these things or no thing at all that remind you that really only a few things matter. Food, trees, words, love, mostly love. Good morning and welcome to this Sunday service of the Eno River Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, or ERUF as we like to say. I'm Reverend Jacqueline Brett, the lead minister here, and whoever you are, wherever you come from, whatever your race, your gender identity, whomever you love, and wherever you are on your spiritual journey, we welcome you here to create beloved community with us. If you are visiting, um, we invite you to rise in body or spirit, uh, or, and if you are 
online, we invite you to put your name in the chat so that we might give you an ear of welcome. Please rise or embody our spirit if you are visiting with us today. <laughs> Welcome, welcome, and we thank you for choosing to spend your Sunday morning with us. And we invite you directly after the service, if you have children with you, to join our children for religious exploration. The children will be sung out directly after the story for all ages, and you can uh, follow that group, and um, our religious ed, uh, exploration folks will tell you what to do. Um, also, if you're an adult, directly after the service is the inquirer's classes for visitors and newcomers. And we have a different class every week that I allow you to find out a little about ERUF and to tell us a little about you. And today's class, I'm actually leading and talking about worship and what we're doing here on Sunday morning. Today is a very special service for us. It is our annual poetry service, and we delight in this time. And you'll be hearing a little more about this service uh, a little later. Um, we will have poems written by others, as well as poems written by some of the poets you see here this morning. Um, we also have special music today. We welcome Cami Rowan, a guitarist and um, composer um, who is with us this morning. Today is also a Generosity Sunday. Generosity um, Sunday is a time when we um, provide our community, with this community, gets an opportunity to practice collective generosity beyond our walls when we designate the Sunday offering to a Durham nonprofit aligned with our UU values. This recipient today will be the Life Skills Foundation, which runs a wraparound safety and support network of housing, mental health care, and living skills for youth who are transitioning out of foster care. Here to tell us more about their work is Shaisha Bell, Director of Programs. Let's welcome Shaisha. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So I'm here to tell you about Life Skills Foundation. I implore you all to think about when you turned 18. For many people, that time is exciting. It's exciting because it's surrounded with parties, uh, maybe getting a car, thinking about what your next plan in life is going to be. But for one segment of the population, it's the complete opposite. For youth transitioning out of foster care, this time is marred with homelessness, lack of education, few life skills, limited resources, little to no support system, and very few opportunities. So nearly 10 years ago, Life Skills Foundation was created to address this break in services for this population, those that are about 16 to 25 in the foster care system. We purchased two small apartment buildings where we are able to provide transitional housing for these youth. So on their 18th birthday, instead of saying, where am I going to go, they will have already engaged with us and know that they can move into our transitional housing where they'll get to simulate living independently. They'll get the opportunity to make mistakes. They won't have to worry about bills. And they can focus on their goals, like obtaining education, finishing their high school diploma, or even go into college. So they'll work with the, uh, like our employment specialists who will help them maybe get a job, focus on some of those soft skills, you know, like not cursing out your boss when they're giving you <laughs> constructive <laughs> criticism or um, some of those interview skills. Um, they'll also participate in therapy to address some of the day-to-day -day stressors uh, that's um, associated with uh, transitioning into adulthood, as well as some of the trauma that is uh, acquired or experienced while in foster care. We'll provide what's called wraparound support. That journey looks completely different for everyone. For some people, that's advocating for them when they go to court. Maybe they had a petty charge and they're facing jail time 
or maybe they have an abusive significant other and we're advocating for them to get a protective order. Sometimes that's helping them apply for food stamps, working on their credit, doing budgets, things like that. Wraparound support really can can kind of run the gamut, um, and I can't even stand up here and give you a list of what that looks like because it's based on the needs of each young person. I kind of think of one young man that comes to mind who came to us on his 18th birthday. A week before he turned 18, his foster parents said, I'm moving and you'll need to leave on your birthday. He was still in high school because his birthday was in February. So he moved in, and every day he went to his base school the school he was already attending, which was out of district. We helped him get to school every day. He would take the bus, the city bus sometimes, and he would come home in the evenings. And we would work with him on making sure he had what he needed for school, making sure he had food. When he moved in, he could barely cook a frozen pizza. We worked with him on his life skills. We helped him apply for college, and he eventually was accepted to college. But college day came, and there was no one there to move him in. So we moved him in. And you know how you have that family and friends weekend in college? There was no one to go with him, so we were there. And on Christmas break, he didn't have a home to go to, so we moved him in. And we made sure he enjoyed Christmas break, and he had stories to go back and tell about. That young man graduated, cum laude, from college. He now works for NASCAR. Thank you. Not every story has such a grand um, kind of finale. However, the goal is to make an impact and to give these young people the opportunity to make decisions about their lives, opportunities to have dreams, opportunities to follow those dreams and achieve those dreams, and most importantly, the opportunity to simply be happy. The youth in the foster care system, the number of youth is not declining. The foster care system will always be here. And these youth are our responsibility. They are ours to take care of. They are ours to help achieve their goals. And so at Life Skills Foundation, that's what we do. To invite forward all of our smallest and mediumest and largest and our children at hardest people. Never easy following up something so passionate and important. Um, this is more of a simple little story. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen some of you in a minute. I saw some of you last week, but not all of you. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. We're getting resituated, finding our spots. Okay, good. So I'm curious, how many of you have been here for RE this summer, religious exploration? One, two, three, I know, okay, so some of you have. Oh, here comes some more people. So this summer, what everybody in the room might not know, is our theme has been Can Do Summer, talking about creative things that some of our youngest and our mediumest can do. And it is Poetry Sunday. So we have a little journey that somebody is going to go on to find a poem. His name is Daniel. How many people know what a poem is? Raise your hand if you, uh, this goes for all of you too. How many people know what a poem is? Okay, okay. How many people feel like they could define a poem? Oh, <laughs> that's exactly the face that I make on the inside. I'm like, how do I define a poem? So it's tricky. Our friend Daniel's gonna, gonna have some thoughts on that. But we're gonna, we're gonna help him. We're gonna help him with our creativity, which is something that Religious Exploration has been doing this summer, focusing on creativity and things that we can do. Daniel knows all the rocks, trees, and animals in the park. On Monday morning, Daniel sees something new on the park gate. A sign reads, Poetry in the Park, Sunday at 6 o'clock. 
What is poetry, Daniel says. Hmm. He looks up in surprise when he hears a spider say, now I gotta say, I'm not sure why the surprise is it that the spider's there or the spider's talking. <laughs> but he is indeed surprised. He looks up in surprise when he hears a spider say, to me, poetry is when morning dew glistens. Can you do that with me with your hands? Ready? Morning dew glistens. You can use both hands. My other hand just happens to be full. On Tuesday, Daniel climbs the old oak tree. He sees Squirrel. Squirrel, do you know what poetry is? Now, at this point, Daniel is accustomed to talking animals. <laughs> poetry is when crisp leaves crunch. Exactly that. So let's put them together. Morning dew glistens, crisp leaves crunch. Good. On Wednesday, Daniel crawl, calls into the chipmunk's hole because as we've determined, Daniel now can talk to animals. Chipmunk, can you tell me what poetry is? Hmm, I wonder if chipmunks know what poetry is. Poetry, hmm, poetry is a home with many windows in an old stone wall. Can you do that? Many windows in an old stone wall. So let's put that together. Morning dew glistens. Crisp leaves crunch. There's a home with many windows in an old stone wall. All right. On Thursday, Daniel makes a boat with a leaf for sail and watches the wind carry it across the pond. He calls quietly to Frog. Excuse me, Frog, what is poetry? Poetry, says Frog, is a cool pool to dive into. Ready, let's dive in, dive in. A little bit of frog noise there. Let's add it in. Morning dew glistens, crisp leaves crunch. There's a home with many windows in an old stone wall. Cool pools to dive in. I wonder what's next. Surely it's a talking animal. On a turtle, I think you're right. On Friday, Dan Daniel parts the cattails and finds turtle. Hello, turtle. I have a question. Do you know what poetry is? I think poetry is sun warmed sand, Turtle says. Can you take a nap in the sun warmed sand? Hmm. Let's put it together. Morning dew glistens, crisp leaves crunch. There's a home with many windows in an old stone wall. Cool pools to dive in, sun warm sand to rest in. All right. I wonder what animal's next. On Saturday afternoon, Daniel finds cricket in the shade of the slide. A wonderful place to be. When the shadows are long, cricket fills the air with his music. Is this poetry to you, cricket? Singing at twilight when the day is done? Indeed it is, Daniel. Can you give me some imaginary singing hands? So let's put it together. Morning dew glistens, crisp leaves crunch. There's a home with many windows in an old stone wall. Cool pools to dive in, sun warm sand to lie in. Singing at twilight when the day is done. Ha 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 ha! You have discovered the secret of the book. <laughs> I do that the whole time. <laughs> I bet. How many people started to figure that out? Did any of you figure that out too? Some of you might have figured it out too. That night, moonlight fills Daniel's room. He hears a whoo. Leaning from his window, he calls to Al. Now, do not lean from your windows at home. I want all of you to be safe. 
but Daniel does it anyway. Owl, what is poetry? <laughs> well, good, good. <laughs> oh, poetry, poetry is bright stars in the branches, moonlight on the grass, and silent wings to take me wherever I go. Good night, dear Daniel, she whispers, and flies off into the night. We'll add that one in just a moment. On Sunday, the sun wakes up Daniel. He is happy when he remembers it's Sunday. I am too. Today is poetry in the park, says Daniel, and I have a poem, as you have noted. So let's say the poem together, ready? Morning dew glistens, crisp leaves crunch. There's a home with many windows in the old stone wall. Cool pools to dive in, sun warm sand to lie in. Singing at twilight when the day is done. Bright stars in the branches, moonlight on the grass, and silent wings to take me wherever I go. On the way home, Daniel stops to watch the sunset sky reflecting in the pond. That looks like poetry to me. To me too says the dragonfly. And with that, we are going to continue our exploration and our curiosities outside. Lead the way, my friend. You did, yeah. You did. Go now in peace. in body or spirit and we are going to sing hymn 1010 in the teal hymnal we give thanks words are also on the screen neighbor. I probably got I 
I invite you to join me now in a moment of meditation for a poem of meditation. It is called School Prayer. In the name of daybreak and the eyelids of morning and the wayfaring moon and the night when it departs, I swear I will not dishonor my soul with hatred, but offer myself humbly as a guardian of nature, as a healer of misery, as a messenger of wonder, as an architect of peace. In the name of the sun and its mirrors and the day that embraces it and the cloud veils drawn over it and the uttermost night and the male and the female and the plants bursting with seed and the crowning seasons of the firefly and the apple, I will honor all life wherever and in whatever form it may dwell on earth my home and in the mansions of the stars let us take a moment to meditate upon these words We hold in our hearts this morning all who are suffering and all who are rejoicing. All the people the world over living with the effects of war, injustice of any kind, and the negative impacts of climate change. We especially hold in our hearts the people of Maui as they begin the journey of recovering from the impact of the, the devastating fires that have come upon them. And may those in the state of North Carolina who have need for safety, health, and bodily care receive what they most need. In our own community, we hold in our hearts Gene Presson as he continues in healing. We hold Tom Fletcher and Mike McLeod and all unnamed beloveds of our community who are managing serious circumstances. We pray that all receive what they most need. We send each of you strength. We send you courage. We send you our love. We are here for you. And finally, we join in the gladness of those who are rejoicing at milestones and celebrations of all kinds. It is good to know that even in the midst of suffering, there also exists the possibilities of joy. And for this, we express our great gratitude. And so it is. Amen and ashe. Our West Virginia Hills for Mother. West Virginia Hills is one of three official state songs and first appeared as a poem in 1846. The original music was written in 1885 by Henry Everett Ingle, and the lyrics are by Ellen Ruddle King. The movement to establish West Virginia Hills as a state song began at the West Virginia Music Educators Association in 1960. On February 3rd, 1961, a resolution to officially adopt the song passed the West Virginia State Legislature. This movement is an arrangement of the West Virginia Hills with an additional original section by the composer.
Thank you, Cammie. Poems express a poet's awareness of presence, feelings, and observations of life, the worlds both within and beyond us. We as readers or listeners connect to a poem most often with an unconscious recognition that even in the briefest of words, a poet has the capacity to tell a story and use language in such a way as to connect to the heart of a matter, to connect to the heart of our heart. What sometimes seems inexpressible can become shaped by the sparseness of haiku, the modern openness of free verse, the lines of a sonnet, or the mythos and sacred writings of scriptural texts and faith traditions the world over created through a cadence of poetic meaning making of the ultimate. And of course, there is the most recent postmodernist and controversial structural form of all, the improvisational and rhythmic complexities of rap. And irrespective of how you might regard it, it is undeniably the newest of the poetic styles embraced among cultures of all kinds and nearly everywhere. Some poems are good medicine, write Phyllis Cole Day and Ruby Wilson, editors of the books known as Poetry of Presence. And they continue, poems soothe our anxieties and self-doubt, restore our balance, boost our energy and strength, help us cope with stress or even heal. And these deeply troubling, divisive, hard to bear times, most of us are sorely in need of good medicine, whether for body, mind, spirit, or heart. In the midst of today's challenges, we here at ERAF attempt to form a meaningful connection and being together as a pluralistic community of faith attempting the continual work of being a container resilient enough to hold a range of spiritual and human beliefs, identities, histories, experiences, and abilities, attempting to center and anchor ourselves with love as the thread weaving through it all, even though we are sometimes hard pressed to define exactly what love is and what it might require of us. Imperfect though we might be in our attempts as humans most often are, I do believe we are becoming ever more steadfast in our attempts and trying moving round and round the spiral of learning ever more deeply the meaning of drawing our circle wider, more deeply into the meaning of being beloved community, the meaning of coming to understand that what we are attempting is no foolish fantasy, especially when the resilience of our container is tested and it feels far easier to move away from it all when the attempts at growing in our commitments and understanding of mutuality and interconnection become uncomfortable and difficult to bear. It would seem easier to move away rather than move toward the challenging inner work that is set before us in the here and the now which is actually when the world we long for, both spiritually and materially, has an opportunity to be created. The fact of the matter is that these challenging times are exactly what we have been called to. The deeply spiritual call of being the world we might imagine. A world that aims toward the well-being of all, 
coming to understand that to do so requires much of us individually and collectively. And yes, it is challenging. And yet, poet James Cruz says that poetry is an art form especially suited to our challenging times. It helps us dive beneath the surface of our lives and enter the place of wider, wilder, more universal knowing. And because poetry is made of the everyday material of language, he says, we each have access to its ability to hold truths that normal conversation simply can't contain. Though we here at ERAF offer this service that places a distinct focus upon poetry once each year, poems actually weave their way through our services all the time in our opening words and chalice lightings, prayers and spoken meditations, or in the benediction, as it is known in some traditions, but which we simply refer to as the closing words. And because reading poetry is one of my greatly loved spiritual practices, I sit for a few moments with the words of a poem each day, seeking to become present to what the poet was present to, or to connect with what, is, what has awakened in my heart, or what I might take into my living of life from what has been bestowed through the poet's insights. And this is our invitation to you today. We offer these poems in the spirit of good medicine. In the spirit of being beloved community and with an understanding that a meaningful connection can be formed in all sorts of ways, which is, the most, which is most important in challenging times. We invite you to open with us and to us and reflect in the light of what is being offered. Perhaps You'll hear a line that will inspire or lift your heart or a phrase that becomes a light by which to see. And so now we shall begin. I wrote this poem a while back when I was struggling with life, even unsure if I wanted to continue the effort. Oddly, the poem seems relevant even now. And life took hold of me and whisked me away, and I cried, no, let me be. Where are you taking me? And life replied, you've sat here and sniveled long enough. You are part of me, tis time you were free. Oh, I was so afraid. My bones were brittle, my muscles trembled, but life would not relent. Though the body was not new and soft and needed not the mother's milk, though full grown and weathered by the years, there was a new life born that day, and it was me. I selected this poem to read because it led me to think about the connection that goes beyond ourselves. Just beyond yourself, it's where you need to be. Half a step in the self-forgetting and the rest restored by what you'll meet. There is a road always beckoning. When you see the two sides of it closing together at that far horizon and deep in the foundations of your own heart at exactly the same time, that's how you know it's the road you have to follow. That's how you know it's where you have to go. 
That's how you know you have to go. That's how you know just beyond yourself is where you need to be. So this poem is an invitation to surrender to the flow of life. There is no controlling life. Try corralling a lightning bolt containing a tornado. Dam a stream, and it will create a new channel. Resist, and the tide will sweep you off your feet. Allow, and grace will carry you to higher ground. The only safety lies in letting it all in. Wild with the weak, fear, fantasies, failures, and success. When loss rips off the doors of the heart or sadness veils your vision with despair, practice becomes simply bearing the truth. And the choice to let go of your known way of being, the whole world is revealed to your new eyes. I'm sharing this poem because it speaks to the connection between the individual and all of existence. What do I fear? I am a part of infinity. I am a portion of a cosmic force, a separate world within a million worlds, a star of the first magnitude, the last to die. The triumph of living, the triumph of breathing, the triumph of existing. The triumph of feeling time flow, glacial, through my veins, and hear the silent stream of night, and stand atop a mountain in the sun. I walk on sun, I stand on sun, I know nothing but the sun. Time transformer, time destroyer, time enchanter. Do you come with new intrigues, a thousand schemes, to offer me a life as a little seed, as a coiled serpent, as a rock out in the sea? Time, you murderer, be gone from me. The sun fills up my breast with lovely honey to the brim. And she says, someday all stars are bound to die, yet they always shine without dread. The meaningful connection I feel with this poem is in the power of the imagery. It's light and approachable, yet profound and somehow practical. Time was, time is, time shall be. Man invented time to be used. Love was, love is, love shall be. Yet man never invented love, nor is love to be used like time. A clock wears numbers 1 to 12, and you look and read its face, and tell the time precisely, exactly. Yet who reads the face of love? Who tells love numbers precisely, exactly? Holding love in a tight hold for keeps, Fastening love down and saying, it's here now and here for always. You don't do this offhand, crass, careless-like. Love costs. Love is not so easy. Nor is the shimmering of stardust, nor the smooth flow of new blossoms, nor the drag of a heavy hungering for someone. 
Love is a white horse you ride, or wheels and hammers leaving you lonely, or a rock in the moonlight for rest, or a sea where phantom ships cross always, or a tall shadow always whispering, or a circle of spray and prisms, maybe a rainbow round your shoulder. Heavy, heavy is love to carry, and light as one rose petal, light as a bubble, a blossom, a remembering bar of music, or a finger, or a wisp of hair, never forgotten. Forrester for Dad. This piece reflects the strength and sometimes dissonant confidence of a young father who develops and grows into a wise man. The composer uses water imagery to represent the father's beauty, flow of emotions, aging wisdom, insight, and self-reflection.
In this second selection of readings, our poets invite you to an even deeper connection with personal worlds. In addition to works by Bruno Tolentino and the former U.S. Poet Laureate Tracy K. Smith, original works will be offered by Gerda Pressen, Lisa Jones, and Sarah Rose Nordgren. I was driving, is this on? Okay. I was driving along a country road when nature took hold of me to teach me a life lesson. And so I wrote this poem. The road threads through the wooded lands where roam the deer and rabbits undisturbed. The squirrels chatter, a bounty of nuts they find, ravishing combs until only core remains. Birds of color, brown and blue, crimson, golden, black and white, chirp and fly about per nature's plan. But lo, the road it carries death, as cars which speed heed not the deer which wander far. Once scurrying squirrels not fast enough to cross the road now dot the tar, flattened except for bushy tail. And so the crows, once free to roam, whose only foe, the hooting owl, now fear the road as well. A comrade, Ebon Black, lies fallen on the road. Friends hover round to mourn their loss as one still wing yet flutters. Around a bend, the car comes fast, expecting birds to fly away from danger toward the sky. A dozen birds hop to the side, but only just enough. The car does slow and carefully glides by. But one black crow with chest puffed full, not e'en one hop does take. She stands her ground beside her fallen friend. Her vigil touches human heart, and she does teach us well. Stand by your friends, not just in life, but at its end as well. I chose this poem because I was very moved by the dreamlike sense of admiration for another artist, for an inspiration. One, I would tender him my eyes if they could help pierce what he sees. I could part ways with much more were it not superfluous to his pace. I would teach my ears that music he crosses with each dawn. I could say, there is nothing to offer, so be patient. He is weaving his voice. I would keep his silence, cast motion away, and wait. His is the world we are dreaming, that grove where light is all inside, where light grows from speech into speech. There is gift in each pause, in each segment, in each of us blinded by ease, excess, hope, there is dependence upon him. We watch as he listens, then reaches for the point where the orchard is gathering that quiet. It is ripening now. Two. The steel of days and hours tears apart. All images return. Now, time is but a garden reconvening under the old light. A shade or two keep the voices near, which once were ripe to depart. There is song, but it is old and new. He comes softly, treading upon the echoes as they lie at last free together. Leaf and bird recognize the intruder. 
we retire from that circle into wonder. He scores the white page of the air, thinking he is not heard. I wrote this poem as I focused on the, <clears throat> the disconnection between myself and the outside world. The drum sounds and rings and rhymes as it translates my mind, my emotion, my drive to forget its intention for all lest there me to struggle and question and reach for my need to refuse the interrogation for I'm no explanation for your questioning mind or your awkward sensation. Uncurling somewhere at the base of your throat though you're eager to know of a goddess who wrote, of an agony too hot to be real, of a passion too savage, a wound that is healed and been sharpened into a fine point of steel, an example of victory, of knowledge, the will to rise from a history of futile attempts, of fumbles, destruction of all the inept, with the need to decipher contents of my creed, the vision embedded, the things that I see, to stand here among you, no strings for the box. You think I fit into, I scramble your thoughts. I refuse to attempt to connect with the space which coddles the sensibilities of those which would insist that I be some magnanimous representative for my gender or my race. That I lay down my royal colors of purple or red, or ignore the importance of the green of the land in order to wave a rainbow flag of pride or march to the beat of Africana. Can I only rant and rave for a cause already predefined for me by the masses? Must mine always take a back seat? Must I toe the line of the hymns and the prayers, the questions, the stares for Minnie's baby, who was taught how to pray for the cross and translate the ancient words of those that refused to show her love? Hmm. But still, I digress. I recenter and find the drum pounds and rolls and thunders the tones as it translates my emotion and speaks to my soul to forget its intention for all lest there me, to share revelation, to embrace my creed. So this poem is a powerful exploration of history and identity. And the imagery in this poem really calls me back home and reminds me that there's, reminds me to find strength in unity. One of the women greeted me. I love you, she said. She didn't know me, but I believed her and a terrible new ache rolled over in my chest, like in a room where the drapes have been swept back. I love you. I love you, as she continued, down the hall, past other strangers, each feeling pierced suddenly by pillars of heavy light. I love you. Throughout the performance and every hand clap, every stomp, I love you and the rusted iron chains, chains someone was made to drag until love let them be unclasped and left empty. 
and the center of the ring. I love you in the water where they pretended to wade, singing that old blood deep song that dragged us into those banks and cast us in. I love you. The angles of it scraping at each throat, shouldering past the swirling dust motes and those beams of light that whatever we now knew, we could let ourselves feel new to climb. Oh, woods, oh, dogs, oh, tree, oh, gun, oh, girl, run. Oh, miraculous many gone. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Is this love the trouble you promised? I wrote this poem after an experience of connection with the spirit of cosmic play. What the spirit said. It said to consume the whole bowl of soup, the last drop of broth, lest its messages be left overnight in the dish. That soup is a kindly mother, that consciousness dwells in the domed caps of mushrooms, in turnip greens, and broken strands of barley pearls. Winking, the spirit undulated over me in the fragrance of earth elements stirred by air, a shimmering gown of sight, scent, and flavor that was always there if a body could perceive it that the pea feels love for the parsley, that the ladle should play like a kit in the brush. There I was at the table, a feast of starlight spread over the cloth, spirit as hostess with the literal mostest. But when I bowed before her, dipping my hair into the night, she laughed with the sound of water and told me to look up. Look up, she mouthed, and to make me laugh with her, appeared before me as a frog walking like an Egyptian. This brought to mind the breaking open of birth giving when I stood over the toilet and screamed to aid in my own rending with no concern for what form the shards might take. That is what my laugh felt like on this almost summer night. The scraps of my voice flying off to be sewn into a softer quilt. And so we weave the fabric of beloved community as we draw our circle wider and commit ourselves to offering as we are able our time, our talent, and treasure as has just been offered. Given as we cultivate hearts of generosity toward our mission, vision, and our work in the world. As the greeters come forward to pass the plates, your offerings will go for our generosity Sunday this morning. And if you do not have cash or checks on hand, we invite you to use the card that you'll find in the pews, and you can point your device to the QR code or go to eref.org on your device and hit the Give Now button and follow the instructions for the drop-down for Generosity Sunday. And if you need assistance with this, you can receive help in the office directly after the service. And we continue now with our offertory.
the gifts of our beloved community and um, the gift of music. Thank you so much for joining us today, Cami. And Cami, yes, we can. And I, I invite you after closing words to remain here if you wish, because Cami will be offering our postlude today. We also give thanks for our talented poets and the gift of poetry. Come forward. Thank you so much. And we'll turn it over to uh, Wendy, who will lead us in our final hymn. Please rise, embody your spirit. We will be singing for all that is our life, hymn number 128 in your gray hymnal. And of course, the words are also on the screen. <laughs> Our closing words today are the poem, The Distance, by Ra Rafael Jesus Gonzalez. The distance between us is holy ground. To be traversed, be feet bare, hand raised in joyous dance, so that once it is crossed, the tracks of our pilgrimage shine in the darkness and light our coming together in a bright and steady light. And so it is, amen and ashe, and go in peace. And please remain for the postlude. <laughs> you may